Hello, hello, and welcome, welcome to another AMCI March Madness presentation. Today is actually a very special one because we have a special guest for you and we pre prepared a wonderful presentation. But before that, allow me to go ahead and talk about a little bit of the technical things out of the way. <laughs> so, um, because, you know, we do prepare a presentation. I want to make sure that webinar will deliver too. So here is here are the things that we want to remind you. So hopefully everybody is viewing us on a computer. Webinar actually recommends that viewing us from a computer will make sure that everybody will go on smoothly. I do have to say that if you are using a work computer or a work phone, please check your settings to make sure that any um, there's no firewall settings that will interfere the ability that for you to view the webinar. Um, also, while you're um, while we are doing this right now, I want you to go ahead and check on your computer audio panel to make sure that that is set up properly. The sound check um, is available to you to check if your um, input and output is good and make sure that you are set up to the computer audio like so, as you can see right here. But if you don't have access to a computer right now, you can also view us via phone. All you need to do is make sure that you download the GoToWebinar app. Webinar actually recommends that that is the best way for you to view us, okay? All right, now that we got that out of the way, I know you wanna know how to get your CEUs for this event. So I'm going to go ahead and um, give you that information right now. So the CEUs, um, you will have to take the assessment um, and upon completion, that assessment, that is when you will get your CEUs. So you will receive this in the webinar email responder one to 24 hours after the presentation. And also if you can wait at the end, we are also gonna share that link actually too. Now, the important thing to remember is to complete your CEU assessment within 48 hours and do not share this link with anyone because it's going to be a violation to AMCI and APC copyright clause. Now, whenever you're taking the assessment, make sure that you provide your full name and the correct information in your assessment for APC and AHIMA verification. And all this must be done within two days, okay? All right. Now we are actually joined by our amazing team here in the chat. Um, I think I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Rochelle and we have Miss Tracy over here too. Um, Miss Tracy, would you like to say a quick hello? Sure. Hello, everyone. Welcome today um, to the event. I know you guys are going to get a lot of great information. I'm excited about today and I'm so happy to see you all here. Thank you, Ms. Tracy. And of course, we have our one and only Mrs. J. She's joining us today and she is actually going to go ahead and introduce a wonders, wonderful speaker. How are you, Mrs. J? I am well, thank you so much, Ms. Rochelle. It, you know what, it is a wonderful, I think it's an honor. I get to introduce Amy Wilcox. She's our speaker for today and with over 30 years experience, among other things, Amy is the Director of Content at Innovi Health. Now, if you didn't know who Innovi Health is, they are the creators of Codepedia, Code, HCC Coder. I think you know that. But what we know here at AMCI, we're very familiar with Find a Code. We exclusively use Find a Code and we exclusively use that ENM coder. And Miss Amy is the creator of the ENM tool. So I am over the moon happy that she's here and she agreed to speak with us today and um, her presentation on telehealth. Now, among the many things that Find a Code has coming out, they also have um, publications and things of that sort. And Amy is also one of the authors of, well, she is the author of the ENM publication. She authors several of the publications. So if I had to use one, or no, let's say three words 
to describe Amy Wilcox, I would say subject matter expert. Yes, she is the epitome of a subject matter expert. And most important, not that she just knows and very knowledgeable about the medical coding arena and profession, I think most important, she respects the profession. She respects her colleagues and medical coding coders, medical coding professionals. And you know what? Let me get to it. It is my pleasure to welcome you, Amy Wilcox, and her presentation on telehealth. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? I know we have people from the West Coast all the way to the East Coast attending, and I hope that getting up early or being able to get up a little bit later, however it works for you, works out for your day to be just be a splendid day. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much, Mrs. J, for that um, introduction. That I'm, I'm just totally red in the cheeks. I um, appreciate uh, how kind you were in that. And we're talking today about telemedicine and becoming the expert, right? And she called me a subject matter expert, which is actually one of my titles for work um, besides director of content. And um, what I wanna say first and foremost is um, a subject matter expert is somebody who is willing to ask questions and acknowledge that they don't know everything. And because you don't, once you recognize that you don't know everything and <laughs> I don't care how long, I mean, I've been in medicine for 30 years. I started as a pharmacy tech and then worked as a medical assistant, certified you know, medical assistant and surgical technician and did all the clinical for the back um, in lab and, and all of that as well. And worked my way through in, in, in certifications and education and became a clinic administrator and a consultant and auditor. I have loved medicine. The, this is such a rich field of um, opportunity. It's insane how much opportunity there is for growth uh, um, starting as a coder. You can expand to anything um, and just can, if you're willing to learn and you're just willing to continue learning and love learning and asking questions because nobody can possibly know everything. It's just not possible. It changes, the information changes constantly. So becoming the expert in anything means you are constantly learning and you're constantly learning from your colleagues. Um, I had a wonderful experience just this morning. Um, you know, I use GoToWebinar all the time, but I usually, um, you know, hit the floor running uh, every morning, just trying to get done everything that I need to and make sure I've met all of my obligations and then continue to learn certain things that I'm trying to become better at. And um, uh, Ms. Rochelle taught me something on GoToWebinar that I love. So I'm gonna see if I can make that, if I can become an expert in making that little transition later at the end of this presentation, you'll see what I'm talking about. Anyway, so again, the biggest thing I wanna stress about becoming an expert is that um, you, um, let me see if I can get my screen here, doesn't wanna, there we go. Um, you want to um, read research and collaborate with people, right? You, I have attended conferences with the whole sole purpose of being, I want to learn what this expert has because I have read their articles, I have followed them, or I have worked with them on a project. And now they're presenting on something and I wanna see if they know something that I don't know, right? And I think every time we, we attend something like this webinar, I hope that you've come with a basic understanding of how telemedicine works. If you don't, I'm gonna give you a basic understanding, but I'm also going to delve into some of the particulars about it that maybe you don't know about. But when we come prepared, like I wanna learn about telemedicine, you wanted to learn about telemedicine, you were willing to get up early or you know, pay a fee to do this and, and then to sit in a chair for two hours to listen about telemedicine. You know, you if you've come with some information and you've come with some questions, I'm hoping that my presentation will share some of that with you. And if not, 
please do not hesitate to send me an email. My contact information is at the very last page. And, um, and if you miss that page, it's in your handouts. Um, and if for some reason your handout came out blurry, uh, which, you know, who knows, you can always contact AMCI and they'll get that information to you. But I would love to answer your question. Um, please no uh, patient information, no, you know, uh, no PHI in, in your questions, if you have questions. Uh, just feel free to send me those. I'd be happy to answer those. Okay, so head, heads up warning. I'm a talker and I'm a fast talker. And no matter how much I try to slow that down, it's just not going to happen. There is a wealth of information in telemedicine. A two-hour presentation doesn't even do it justice. So I mean, I could spend an entire day on it and you would walk away going, wow, there's so much here. And I still would not have completely um, explained it all to you. So we're going to do our best. Here we go. I want to first talk to you about learning and loving learning. Okay, so Malcolm Gladwell and Anders Erickson. Anders Erickson did a study on violinists and becoming an expert in violinists. And he found that these 20-something-year-olds that were experts, um, that he asked them some questions about how long they'd practiced to get to become an expert. And the average was before the age of 20, they'd practice about 10,000 hours. Well, Malcolm Gladwell took that information and he kind of used it to his benefit, you know, and, and, and it wasn't completely valid, but he, you know, because of what he had stated um, from a study that was just a very loose study, um, he said, oh, you know, it takes you 10,000. I mean, how many of you have heard that? It takes 10,000 hours to become an expert on something. Well, um, that's not necessarily true because you, if you pull apart that study and you pull apart those questions, you know, how many of those people um, spent 10,000 hours, uh, not the violinist, but somebody who wants to become an expert, think about your own profession as a coder. What if you are learning from somebody who, who has bad information, right? Who doesn't have the right resources. And so you've spent, all this time studying and learning about coding with the wrong information. Uh, so you're not really an expert, you're an expert in the wrong information. <laughs> and that's not what we're looking for, right? So we want to be very careful in that, um, you know, what, what we are looking for um, is, is coming from the right sources. Uh, so, you know, what is the area that you want to be an expert in? That's the first thing I would say is you want to identify what you want to become an expert in. And if you're in coding, you can become an expert in all kinds of things, right? You can expand your horizons if you just went and got your CPC or your CCSP um, or, you know, a credential, a basic coding credential. You can, if, if you start working for, let's say your first job is with a, an otolaryngologist, right? Now, you, all of your learning is going to be in your seat while you're doing the job. And what if you want to become an expert at you know, ENT coding? So you can do that. And actually, there's some subspecialty uh, certifications that you can get. So, or you can say, you know what, I really want to become a consultant and an auditor myself. So then you look at that path and you see people who've been successful at that, companies that sell product that is successful and helps them pass certification, right? AMCI has a great course for getting your certification with, you know, your, your uh, coding credentials. And you look and you see, um, okay, is this a valid source? This is a successful source. And then you study it and you work on it. So identify the area you want to be an expert in, assess the skill set, kind of like coming today for telemedicine. How prepared are you? How much do you already know? And then afterwards, what are you going to do to expand on that? Identify an expert, you're doing that today. Um, we're we going to talk about telehealth. I've given many, many, many presentations across the country on telemedicine, and there's different facets of telemedicine. Um, and then read and study written work. See if you can use them as a mentor. Volunteer time. Be prepared. Work hard. Study, 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 and then put it into play. Put it into practice. And then write about what you've learned. That is a key thing. I don't know if any of you have ever had to teach somebody else something about coding. Once you've done that, it just reiterates, it reaffirms or reconfirms what you already know. And especially if you have to add any, a resource to it. And so I would challenge you that when you are doing any type of training, that when you're going to teach somebody a topic, that you find your resource that supports that topic. 
um, dealing with your physicians, they will respect that, especially if you um, tell them, here's how Medicare does this, and here is the link to that resource on the webinar, uh, on the, the cms.gov site. They will love that. Okay. Now, what is telemedicine? So communication between a patient and an appropriately educated, licensed, and credentialed healthcare provider. A lot of us think provider, you know, our provider, but you need to make sure. So there are some very specific things because based on the payer that you're dealing with, like Medicare, for example, if they are ineligible because they're on the uh, on the wrong list to, you know, not not allowing them to practice as a Medicare provider, but here they are billing, you could run into problems. And that could be something very simple in the background is maybe one of your nurse practitioners who's uh, got problems with her, her effective dates or her eligibility or her enrollment. Um, so you want to always make sure that you are looking at, based on your state, and then the payer, an appropriately educated, licensed, and credentialed healthcare provider. Um, so you have different types of communication on telemedicine. You have live, which is audiovisual, and you know, you'll see AV or live communication or synchronous. It's called synchronous. And synchronous um, is what Medicare requires, right? And most payers require synchronous to be a telemedicine service. Now, there are also options for remote communication, which is, um, sorry, <clears throat> so your remote communications can be remote monitoring or store and forward, which is asynchronous. And asynchronous, A meaning not synchronous, um, that this is a communication where maybe you're just um, verbally, so it's just auto, audio, right? You're on the phone and you're not visually seeing that patient where you can see them talking, you can see their face, you can examine them, and they can hear you and see you as the provider at the same time. Um, if you are, you know, we've had through the pandemic going on, we've had a lot of leniency, and we're going to get into that on um, synchronous versus asynchronous coverage through Medicare. And that's been because you've had a lot of patients who've been forced into telemedicine, but they only have a telephone, you know, or they're like my mom, almost 80, and she's trying to figure out, you know, how to do a, a Facebook Live, or she's trying to figure out how to get on a Skype to talk to my son who's in another country, you know, and so these are things that are, that are hard for her, hard for our elderly to manage, or sometimes you have people who live rurally, and they don't have great connectivity, but their phone service works fine. Um, so there's been leniencies given for those. So you have live audiovisual or synchronous. You have asynchronous, which is also store and forward, which you could have a, this is a, a there's a federal demonstrations telehealth project. Um, and it is in Alaska and in um, Hawaii. And it's a, a federal project and it allows for Medicare and all federal uh, payers, the ability for anybody in Alaska or Hawaii to do store and forward and have it covered as telemedicine rather than um, synchronous. And the reason is because you have a lot of these people who live out where there's really not good connectivity. So what they can do is they can record um, a video of themselves or you know um, a, a transmission of themselves and that gets sent to their doctor who then looks at it, reviews it, and sends back um, an answer. So store, you take it, you store it, you send it off through email, and then they review it at a different time that's not synchronous. And then they respond, and that's okay. And then remote, for example, if you have like a Holter monitor where a patient has to wear, the, it's an EKG, and they put it on and they have to wear it for 24 to 36 hours, sometimes a month, they'll monitor somebody's heart like that. Um, and then you have constant transmissions. And I'll tell you for an example, my uh, my oldest son has um, a defect in his heart and it caused electrical, he had too much electrical um, connectivity, uh, ele electrical networks in his heart. And so um, what they did is they put him, they, he was a serious athlete and all of a sudden his heart would start racing just out of control and irregularly. And we were very concerned about Wolf Parkinson's white, which can cause you to just drop dead. And so they had been evaluating him since he was a little kid, but couldn't put their fingers on what the problem was, but they were able to rule out that. Um, 
so they finally, when he got older, he was about 18 years old, and they put him on a Holter monitor, and that Holter monitor would send constant transmissions to the hospital, where a set of nurses were watching that monitoring. And uh, if something was flagged, and you know the, the beeping would go off for the hospital, and they would note that this is showing an irregularity, and if there was a problem, they would contact us. Um, and um, by doing that, it allowed, you know, the patient to be aware if there was a problem. It would also allow them to see um, information that needed to be sent to the physician for further review. And that that's, you know, pretty constant. And the funny thing is, I always knew that they did that, but I didn't realize how on on the second they were. I mean, just really on top of it. Uh, my son was out playing basketball with some friends. I get a phone call from the hospital nurse. They said, do we need to dispatch an ambulance? I see heart rates just going crazy here. Um, what's your, where's your son? How, is he okay? Is he down? Do we need to dispatch an ambulance? And of course, I freaked out for a second, but I called my son and he's like out of breath. And I'm like, are you okay? What's going on? And he goes, we're playing basketball, mom. I'm fine. And I said, stop and take your pulse. And he goes, yeah, it's pretty high. I'm like, stop, <laughs> you know, but he was fine. But that's how how to the second they are with watching that transmission. And those are your remote monitoring, okay? And then you have communications technology-based services, non-face-to-face -face digital, email and texting. And you know that whole group of codes that came out in 2019, you can do your e-visits, you can do your virtual visits, um, telephone visits, there's uh, through the portal, you can get paid for that. You can get paid for doctors consulting with other doctors about your case. Those are all CTBS services. They're not telehealth, but they're listed on the telehealth list of services that are available through Medicare just because of the confusion. So they have made arrangements, Medicare has, that if billing just didn't, you know, maybe you added the wrong modifier or whatever to uh, or the place of service code to report for telemedicine, the CTBS services, that they would still allow that and not, you know, cause problems with reimbursement. They just knew that a lot of people were confused thinking that those were actually telehealth, but those services actually came out before the pandemic. We're going to talk about that. So there's a lot of fun stuff that goes on with telemedicine. Now, um, I've done presentations about how to encourage people to use telehealth or how telehealth is being used uh, throughout the United States. And some of the fun things that you see are these kiosks. So for example, Anthem in California has really gone to town on trying to provide telemedicine services, uh, um, convenient telemedicine services. So you have some large corporations where they'll have a kiosk down in their main floor and or you know in the employee lounge somewhere and what they do is you can go in and it's like a little pod right you can go in there's a chair there's a computer monitor and screen and you can close the door and lock it you're in there nobody can see you nobody can hear your conversation it's very hipaa compliant and you can put in your insurance card and put all your information in and then do an exam. They've got a pulse, you know, oximeter there. They've got a um, the way to read your blood pressure and your heart rate and everything. Um, they even have little cameras so you can go put your eyeball right up there if they need to look into your eye or the skin area. And even pay. You can pay with your card, your HSA or your Venmo or your credit card or however, right? And you can have an office visit right then and there. And then those that information is downloaded and it is sent um, to your provider, whoever you've de designated as your regular provider. They will automatically send that encounter note to them so that their medical record, your medical record, stays current. There are tables. So if you're in the hospital, then they have this cart that gets pushed around and the cart has a big monitor on it. So, and then it's got a keyboard and attached things like a blood pressure cuff and a pulse oximeter and a thermometer and all of the different things that they may need based on the area um, that, you know, or, or the floor that you're on. If you're in the ICU unit, if you're in a cardiovascular unit, if you're critical care, whatever it might be. And they push this card around, a nurse will push it around and you see, it's pretty funny sometimes. You see, here's the doctor's face on there. You're just pushing around so you can see his patients, right? There are a lot of restrictions there as well that have been for a long time. And Medicare of all the payers has been the most strict 
as to what they will cover, how they'll cover it, when they'll cover it, who performs it, where it's performed, all of that. And due to the pandemic, a lot of those things changed with the waivers. And we're going to talk about that when we get there. But there's um, uh, HIPAA compliant or HIPAA protected software, right? There's very specific requirements of um, telemedicine, so software that is being used to conduct telehealth services, that it has to be encrypted, it has to be able to be backed up and it has to be able to be stored um, and accessed. So there's a law and it has to you know, comply with that. It's not a public facing, you know, like TikTok. I don't know how many of you play with TikTok, man, you could get lost in TikTok. There's some funny, funny stuff in there. Um, I like to play in there with So I keep in touch with my nieces that are younger and, and we laugh and joke and send funny stuff back and forth and my kids also, um, but TikTok, you know, how many times have you been scrolling on that and all of a sudden you see something that's a live event? That's what they're talking about. You can't use TikTok to communicate for telemedicine. It's a public facing event, which means that you may be having a live TikTok event with your provider and I just happen to scroll across it. Now I get to watch, right? I get to watch and listen to your conversation with the provider and you don't even know I'm there. So that's, that's what we're trying to avoid, uh, things like that. And so they were very specific about non-public facing um, products during the pandemic only that could apply towards the 1135 waivers for HIPAA compliance. Um, all right, then you have all the encounter tools and it's pretty fun. If you dig into telehealth at all, you'll find that a lot of the services and a lot of the things that um, uh, a lot of the tools and um, machines that we have available in medical practices to help us with our jobs, you know, um, uh, ultrasounds, blood pressure cuffs, heart rate sensors, uh, SpO2, um, all of these, they were used in NASA first. As a matter of fact, NASA is the number one developer of medical um, uh, new technology that comes down because they're trying to be able to make it so that a an astronaut can self-care off of the planet right so here they are far far away not even on our planet and something goes wrong they've created these great ultrasounds they've got these machines that will identify a problem diagnose the problem and then repair the problem um just some pretty crazy fun things. And then after a while, we see those come out and be available to them in the medical market. So our physicians can have access to them. So quickly over to the other side, one of the things about telemedicine that is really great, and, and I lived in the third world country, I had to deliver a baby in a dirt road in Ecuador um, in 1987. And um, I was there doing uh, work for my church and I was a medical welfare proselyting missionary at the medical background. So I had my EMT and my medical assisting and all of that before I went down. And we worked with a lot of families that were um, extremely poor, uh, bamboo huts, dirt floors, no electricity, no running water, no toilets. And um, the children, unfortunately, a lot of the children died before they reached a year due to malnourishment and parasites. So part of our, our services where we would go in and you obviously cannot teach somebody anything um, when they are in a desperate temporal state. And when you walk into a home and the children are crying constantly and they have that big, big round belly, but their little arms and legs look like the bones with skin on them. Um, that's malnourishment and parasites. And so you have to treat the temporal needs first. And so we would go in and we would always um, get connected with a physician in the area and we would donate some of our time to helping him with their patients in exchange for them to help our, our, our people that we were working with, these families, um, um, to help them get over the parasites and, and get well and then we would teach them how to treat their water, how to treat their, you know, what products to use or not use um, to protect these children and get them sound again and, and, and healthy. And then everybody at home would calm down and then dad would come home with his paycheck instead of not wanting to come home and 
you know, he'd go out with his buddies and drink it away because everything's chaotic at home. And then you have this cute little family that then you can talk to and help and help educate and, and then, you know, help improve their lives. And that was a lot of fun. But delivering this baby out in the middle of nowhere in the dirt, I panicked. I mean, I did a great job. Baby was delivered. Everything was fine. And we got her to a hospital facility. But I would have given my right arm to have access to one of the physicians I worked for in the United States, right? Because up till then, I'd been trained on how to deliver a baby by in, in an emergency situation, but I had never actually done it. And here was a serious emergency situation. And we find that there are 20% of Americans that live in rural areas served by only 9% of healthcare providers. And that's in the United States. Outside the United States, that situation that I just shared with you, that's common in so many countries. Um, and so being able to have this act, you know, access and internet connectivity and do telemedicine has been just a lifesaver. If you look at the basis of telemedicine, there were a lot of um, international benefits due to massive earthquakes in Mexico and Turkey that created this interconnectivity between the United States physicians and physicians around the world, and they were able to help. And so this has really been a, a leading thing of being able to uh, expand telemedicine. In Alaska, you know, 200 of the villages are accessible only by boat or bush plane. So telemedicine is a great service there. Same with Hawaii and some of the other islands. Um, and then Kaiser Permanente, I thought this was interesting. In 2018, 56% of their physician patient encounters were in telemedicine. Okay, so how can it help your community? Well, I've put a list here of things that you can do and ways that you can help in your own practice to expand telemedicine to your community of patients, right? Um, so when you, you can screen patients who have symptoms of COVID, right? If you're trying to avoid them coming into your practice and COVID is the issue, then there's a, you know different treatments. We can screen them ahead of time uh, and, and decide where they need to go. You can provide low risk urgent care for non COVID conditions. You have to remember we have a slew of patients out there who have diabetes and hypertension and heart disease and other chronic conditions that just need to be maintained. And if they're starting to have exacerbation, then we need to be able to treat those. But those patients aren't sick, right? They have a chronic condition. They're not sick. It's not an acute situation for them. And so you don't want to bring them and they don't want to show up into your waiting room if they don't have to. So creating a, a low risk, urgent care, you know, for non-COVID conditions is very helpful. And then I'm not gonna go into all of these, but there's a significant number of these that you could provide and especially education for our patients. Some telehealth success stories. Uh, wow, there are some significant success stories out there. Um, so mental health is a big one. We know, first of all, I don't know how many of you are realize if you get a chance to today, go research it, but how many public health emergencies have been declared in the last year, year and a half? Three of them. One of them is on, on opioid abuse, right? Substance use disorders. Um, anyway, so the, you know, a, a, um, public health emergency has to be declared to be formal. It has to be declared by the president of the United States. That has a triggering effect for the secretary of health. The secretary of health then can go in and make modifications uh, to the social security act under section 1135. So that's where that section 1135 waivers come into place. And then they can make all of these changes that allow and make better facility or better facilitate the, um, the needs of the community at the time. Mental health has been one of those. So they've expanded on mental health um, and they feel, they feel that, you know, one in five, the studies are one in five people have mental illness and only 80 of those, of those people with mental illness, 80% believe that treatment actually works. But it is associated for them, the thing that prevents them from getting or seeking care is stigma, fear, shame, access to care, and I thought this was interesting that only half of the United States counties um, have a psychiatrist, have, have one. So, so there's 
half of US counties without a single psychiatrist. That's 111 million live in professional shortage areas. And professional shortage areas, that's, a, that's some terminology you'll hear with Medicare. And if you've dealt with telemedicine in the past with Medicare, you realize that they have a, a health professional shortage area, or HIPSA, that um, they used in the past to determine who gets to use telemedicine. Now, because of the PHE, you can get it in your home or pre pretty much anywhere through Medicare and have it paid. But previously, you had to live in a shortage area where those professionals were not available. But now you can connect anywhere with service or even a crisis helpline, right? And what they've found is by using telemedicine, there's a reduction in days lost from work. There's child care, uh, you know, that you don't have to worry about transportation issues. Just think about like I've had to try and get off work to take drive us an hour north to pick up my mother to take her to a doctor and then take her back home and then get back home. My whole day's gone. Where if she can do a telemedicine visit, all we have to do is have my sister connect her to that doctor uh, and she's sitting in her room and she has that appointment. And that's been a massive blessing. Work related injuries, triaging. Um, you know, I, I have one, one of the uh, cost savings for Cheesecake Factory. They saved $150,000 one year. And the way they did it is this, they use telemedicine to do their triaging. So if an employee gets injured, they take the employee and they get them online and they do an assessment with a nurse. That nurse then can decide, does that patient need to go to the ER, to the urgent care, or can they wait and get it, see if they can get in with their regular doctor that day or the next day? How serious is the illness? What needs to happen? And that patient gets that care immediately. And they found because of that, that um, the costs and savings, I mean, think about how expensive the ER is. How many of you guys, if I was with you in the room, I'd have you raise your hand. How many of you guys have had an emergency and you thought, I can make it to the morning to see my doctor or go to the urgent care I don't need to go to the emergency room tonight and chalk up a bill for three grand, right? The emergency room is very expensive, but previously, if you had an accident at Jesus Cake Factory, they just sent you to the emergency room to get an evaluation to make sure that they weren't missing something and then being held liable. That's very expensive. States are funding better internet connectivity. I don't know if you've seen that. I know in the state of Utah, where I'm from, um, they have... Uh, massive amount of funding that they threw towards um, expanding bandwidth and making sure it gets to the rural communities. And then you can use it for monitoring chronic health conditions to prevent hospitalization or crisis. So you have these patients, you know, who who um, have chronic conditions like we were talking about, and but if they're if they have a massive exa or severe exacerbation, they could end up in the hospital or the emergency room. And you have some who are refusing to go because they're afraid they're going to get COVID. And so we've had a lot of deaths that are related to the fact that they didn't want to, or they didn't get to quick enough, the emergency room. So these are all programs. There's programs that are set up like a cancer patient receiving remote evaluations and avoiding when they're you know, vulnerable because their immune system's depressed, it's totally suppressed. They go anywhere and they can be subject to any kind of infection. Um, so they're making these remote available. I know prenatal and neonatal services, um, young mothers, uh, just trying to make sure that they get that information uh, ahead of time. So it, it takes the stigma away. It, it gives access where access would not have been otherwise. Um, safeguards for telehealth, you know, you want to be really careful with a couple of things. And that is that you want to make sure you understand um, I mean, as all of you probably know, if, you, if you're working as coders, what happens is um, you, you learn and you get trained on the code sets, right? So your ICD-10, HCPCS, and CPT codes. And you learn how to use them, how to navigate them, how to locate them, all of the excludes, includes, you know, the edits that go with them, all of the rules and guidelines. But then you sit your butt in the seat in your office that you're going to be working at for whatever physician or organization or group that it is you're gonna work at. And things are different, right? All of a sudden you have to know how to apply Medicare rules or Medicaid for Virginia or Medicaid for California or Medicaid for New York, you know, what those guidelines are or workers' compensation or property and casualty, right? You have to, you have to learn how those guidelines and policies for those payers apply to how you will assign a code. 
um, and how what, what code you'll report. And that, that gets tricky. Well, in telemedicine, that's the biggest limitation. So in telemedicine, you have federal guidelines and those federal guidelines come from CMS and they are for federal payers. You have Medicare, Medicaid, but Medicaid is managed by the state. So you have some federal guidelines that have to be managed, have to be followed for Medicare, Medicaid, because they get some funding. Um, and then the state itself gets to decide how all other aspects of it are going to be managed, all the policies individually. So there is, and then the state also manages how private payers are managed in the state and how the Department of Labor for that state manages workers' compensation or property and casual, right? And so they have those insurances have to follow state regulations. So in your individual state, you need to understand how your providers, your individual providers need to be educated, licensed, and credentialed. You need to understand what the federal laws are for any federal plans that you're contracted with. And then you need to, and enrollment for them and their policies. And then you need to understand how the state regulations mandate um, that you manage um, how you bill, what your timely filing is, if there's any limitations. And just some simple things, just a real quick example. I was doing an audit one time and I found that the state had a restriction, a state regulation that said, you have 365 days, the payer does 365 days from the date they receive a clean claim to actually pay and audit that claim, right? Whereas I see a lot of audits that come back three years, three to five years later. And so they're auditing back three to five years. And that audit ended very quickly because they did an audit within the 365 timeframe that provider got off scot-free. Interesting. So you want to know what your rules and regulations are. You want to know your resources. So always, you know, um, 42 CFR, your code of federal regulations, go in there and read up on what the regulations are and then look up your individual state regulations and, and see if they have, if your state is one of those that is very nitpicky and they're very detailed about what the rules are. Um, and if they're not, you'll see that as well. And you're like, darn it, I really wish that they did. And, but it doesn't mean that providers can't go and say, hey, state, we'd like to propose that this be addressed and added to the state regs. You have opportunities there to speak up as well. Okay, so you want to be able to identify who's in charge, uh, track eligibility criteria based on specific specialty. Um, you know, so for example, during the pandemic and prior to the pandemic, Medicare had a list of who could and could not perform telemedicine services, right? Because you can look at, um, for example, a chiropractor was only given, you know, three codes that they can ever bill to Medicare. And none of those three codes could be performed because they require, you know, manipulation, physical, hands-on, could be performed telemedicine. So they are not allowed to perform telemedicine services. But you have speech therapy and physical therapy and um, occupational therapy that were just added due to the pandemic, that they can now do that. But prior to the pandemic, they were not allowed to. Um, so the pandemic has opened the eyes of how can we make this telemedicine service feasible, what is possible and what is not possible. And that usually you know, guides who can and can't perform. So you want to know who can and can't perform. You want to watch the Office of Civil Rights announcements based on HIPAA and COVID-19 to make sure that you're compliant. And you definitely want to have training meetings. You know, if you're not having training meetings at minimum monthly with your staff and your providers, you can even do them separately if that's how the providers want to do it. Just making sure everybody is on task. I mean, you know about the PPE, um, you know, the masks and, and the sanitizer and the cleaning and all of that has to be done. You know, that needs to be, make sure everybody is aware uh, urgent versus emergency protocols. You know, how are you, those going to be handled? How are you going to handle lab services or prescription refills or the equipment that's managed in the office? So all of these things um, and coding and documentation for telemedicine services, what the rules and regulations are. So those meetings are really important and they go towards crediting you for compliance plan that is 
a living compliance plan. And we'll talk about that later as well. So limitations, you have interstate licensure and other regulatory issues. They all vary by state, right? So you, have, you hear that some doctors are providing services in other states and there's legal issues about their licensing and credentialing that allows them to do that or prohibits them from doing that. And also whether the payer will pay for it if it's done in another state. So Medicare right now, we know due to the PHE, Medicare has authorized that their providers who are in good standing and enrolled providers contracted credentialed with Medicare can perform services in another state. So that other state, if they're short on supply or whatever, they could contact through telemedicine and get paid for that. That's a covered service, but you have to make sure that you're following exactly what the requirements are. Um, some situations are just better handled in person, right? Um, depending on the circumstance for, and I'll give you just a quick example. I have a family member who has a telemedicine service that was set up, but then when they found out that that individual has some heart issues, uh, they said, we want to put a stethoscope on, on his chest. So uh, I need that patient to come in office for that visit instead of for telemedicine. That's a doctor who's right on top of it, right? They're thinking ahead. They're looking, there's communication. There's policies and protocols set up in their compliance plan in the office that says, hey, if this patient has this problem, this problem, or this problem, I'm going to need to see them physically in the office so that I can do an examination, right? That's appropriate. And we're not just wasting time because who wants to waste time if I get on a telemedicine visit and they say, oh, we should have had you come in. Well, that was a great waste of time. Now, when's your next opening? And now do I have to take off time from work again, right? So you, you want to make sure that you're on top of that, identifying those patients who are better off for an in-person visit and those that can uh, easily be done via telemedicine. There are some sensitive topics that need to be private. I mean, if you're dealing with mental health and you're dealing with abuse issues, for example, you don't want a wife or um, you know, a spouse who's dealing with spousal abuse trying to have a private tele telehealth conversation you know, in their home where their spouse is also. <laughs> that could be detrimental. So we want to be sensitive to certain circumstances and situations. Um, you know, if you're dealing with somebody who has an opioid use disorder and they are living in, a, in, in their own private hell in their home, you want to pull them out of there if possible to have a conversation of how they can manage that problems that are that are developed in their home life and maybe settle things down a little bit, how they can, you know, build some skill sets to help them and pulling them out and having them in a private um, office setting is is beneficial to them or in a, in a different location, if they can be in their car somewhere else and do that, you know, via telemedicine service. Uh, limited access to technology. You know, we have patients who are older, like I was telling you about my mom, who they really struggle to handle the technology. It's just not you know, something that they were raised with or grasped easily. And I mean, this is, we're talking people to the age of 55, 50, 55 and older. Um, and you would think 50, 55, what are you talking about? You know, I'm, I'm very adept at using stuff, but when I went to a, for one example, I went to a provider's group to do audits and internal training of the providers. And as I'm there working with the physicians, I have this one physician that I'm working with, asked to work with because they're really struggling. And it turned out that the physician was constantly assigning to every single patient, he was putting up the template. This was a general practice physician, and he was always pulling in a neurology specialist physical or template for their exam. And the reason was, when I got to figure out a little bit more was he just simply didn't know how to pull in or create his own template and nobody had worked with him. And he was dealing with some pride issues. None of us have ever seen a provider with pride issues, right? Where he just was not going to admit that he had a problem with the EHR that he couldn't handle, you know, using technology. And so it came down to him, you know, really angry every time I came in because he didn't want to deal with me. Um, and I'm, trying to explain to him the easiest way to go. Don't use that template because then your note is not correct or you're doing too much because you're actually doing everything in that template and it's not required for an ear infection, right? And, and he would like, well, what am I supposed to do? And how am I supposed to do this? And he would just get really frustrated. And I said, well, let's just open a free text box, right? Where you can just free write in your entire exam. 
You don't need to use a template. You don't need to use any macros, nothing like that. Let's make it really simple. You're just typing in a note, whatever you want it to be. So he goes, fine, we can do that. And he sits down. Then he looks at me. How do I do that? And I'm like, how do you access the free text box? And he goes, yeah, it was a simple button. He didn't know where to look because he wasn't familiar enough with the technology. Brilliant, brilliant physician. And all of the attitude came from feeling stupid because he didn't know how to use his own EHR system. And he didn't know how to ask for help because he didn't wanna make the practice look bad or make himself look bad. So be sensitive to that. That's really important that you create an atmosphere of learning that doesn't, um, doesn't make somebody look bad that you know they don't they don't have to feel dumb especially our providers we're trying to protect our providers right so we definitely want to make sure that they have access to whatever education and training that they need in a non-judgmental way um all right so who governs what and we're just going to go through these very quickly federally we talked about that medicare has separate guidelines and they're usually very strict the state programs manage Medicaid and state workers' compensation. They also govern over commercial payers, property and casualty. And then you have international. But first, I want to step back. We have some companies, you know, large, large payer companies, United Healthcare, Aetna, Cigna, Blue Cross, Blue Shield. I mean, I could go down this long list. And they have, you know, insurance in every state in the United States. They offer insurance, right? But they, they're programs, they're, um, what they're limited to and their rules are changed depending on the state that they're in. So that's very important that you understand that when you look up a Medicare, uh, a Blue Cross Blue Shield policy, that you're not looking at what that policy is in Florida and you live in Washington. You got to make sure you're looking at your state, okay, when you're looking at generalities. And when you're looking at specifics about a very specific policy that you're linking that to the payer policy, that that beneficiary has. Okay, and then international, I wanted to just cover this. Like we have HIPAA, international has the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. And that basically means that anybody in, in, the, in um, Europe that's part of that European Union, they have the ability to decide who gets to see their information and who does not. It's extremely protected and the penalties are far greater i mean you would panic to see what some of those penalties are in the united states for hipaa compliance breaches it's like 250,000 to begin with right but international it is massive and so if you see patients in your practice in the united states via telemedicine that are in europe they still are governed by that even if they're an american uh, living there or working there even if they are part of your company and they're in the European Union and you're offering treatment for them while they're outside of the country, that you need to understand how these guidelines work. And those are the state, the, the countries that are included in that. Federal regulations, like I said, 42 CFR, Code of Federal Regulations. For telehealth, it's 410.78. You can go look up that and you can read what the federal rules and guidelines are, the regulations for this. Um, and then the Secretary of, Health, Secretary of Health and Human Services can make changes during a declared public health emergency. Uh, this is for CMS, Medicare, and other federal payers, right? And that includes the Child's uh, Health Insurance, Children's Health Insurance Program, uh, and the ACA plans. A lot of people forget that the ACA plans or the Obamacare, you know, the um, um, Affordable Care Act plans, those are federal plans. So they have to run and, and be governed by federal law. So if you are receiving a single penny of any monies from any of these federal programs, you must have a compliance program in place in your office. Um, it can be very general, but it has to be a living compliance plan, which means if we, I walked into your office, this is how I would use it as a private auditor. I walk into your office and you would say, look, we're auditing EKGs and echocardiograms and treadmill you know, uh, services. And we want to see if, you know, these are the codes that we're dealing with and we want you to audit us and find out whether or not we're compliant with the different payers that we're dealing with or if we need to some changes, if our documentation is up to snuff. And my first question would be, do you have a compliance plan that addresses any of these specifics? 
and they would either go to their shelf and pull off this book and blow the dust off and hand it to me and I immediately go oh that's not bueno that's not good or they would say oh yeah here it is and we last time we updated it was uh, six months ago this change came out so this is how our providers are being told to do it now that's what you want to see right it's a living compliance plan COVID hit changes were made was that added to your compliance plan how are you handling those things? That should be in your compliance plan. And that makes it a living plan. State, you have state regs, state parity laws. And I'm gonna talk about this real quick. This is gonna be one of the questions in your, uh, uh, your quiz that you get. Um, state parity laws. So when you are dealing with uh, an insurance company um, and you have a product like telemedicine, right? So we know that telemedicine, if it's done audiovisual, is considered the same as an in-person visit, right? You get to see them and hear them, um, you know, same time, you know, it, it's just a, a real visit. Uh, without one of the audio or visual, it doesn't become that, it becomes a store and forward or an asynchronous. So <clears throat> if I go into the doctor's office physically and I'm there and I see him and he puts his hands on me and he does my exam and then he talks to me and he counsels me and he does a test or whatever, and then I go home, that's an E&M service, right? But if I'm a telemedicine, um, that is also an E&M service. But there are rules and regulations that each state has in their regulations that state that you must you know, pay for these blah, blah, blah. A telemedicine service is different. It's different because it's not an in-person visit. So some states have a parity law that says that the payers must pay at the same rate as an office visit for telemedicine services. And some states don't have those. And some states say every payer has to pay uh, and approve for a telemedicine visit. So what does your state say? And there are, um, there's a wide range of, of things that are different there. Okay, from state to state, it varies. So you need to understand what your state parity laws are and whether your payers are paying you according to your state parity laws. Now, if you're getting 20 bucks for a telemedicine visit and that's all the payers ever going to pay, that's because they've decided we're only paying 20 bucks for, you know, for it. And there's probably not a state parity law in place. In that case, you may want to have your association put in a note to your state Senate to say, hey, we would like to figure out how to have parity laws put in place Place. please make this a priority in our state there are a lot of states who just let telehealth happen however it would happen and they don't have anything uh, for it um, there were quite a number of states that had zero parity laws in place or zero guidance on telemedicine and then when the pandemic hit a lot of them updated and started really looking at that because they were finally forced to do so so you also have consent you know remember that now you have to have a consent every time you do telemedicine, but you can do it now annually. And you wanna to watch to see if that changes. So that was brought out in the 1135 waivers that you could get a consent, but that consent could be happening at the time of the visit. So you know if the doctor's on, or, or if you're getting that patient prep to come on, you could send them a consent form that they can then review and sign before they get on with the doctor. And then the doctor at the time that they get on with the patient could also say, hey, I wanna make sure you got that consent form. Let's go over a few of those details here, right? I can't guarantee 100% um, that, that our communication will not be seen, um, but we've done everything in our power to protect it via HIPAA. Um, we are not allowed to prescribe, you know, uh, you know, schedule two drugs over the phone. Uh, we are not allowed to prescribe on the first visit, maybe. That's your state's rules. Depends, every state's different. Um, there are, your deductible will apply. There's some really good consent forms that you can find if you just Google uh, telemedicine consent forms online, you will find some good ones that are full of great information and you can customize them to your practice. Your HIPAA compliance, your prescribing laws, how telehealth can and can't be used right? Like we talked about, can't be used for chiropractor service, right? Obviously, you can't use it for an injection because you can't do that through the computer monitor. Got to be hands-on. And then, you know, things that you allow your patient to do, they can select their own physician or do you just have a physician who's handling telemedicine that day and anybody who gets offered telemedicine has to see that provider. Um, you know, the 
the pharmacy of choice that they're going to have their prescriptions sent to, um, access through a portal to their patient medical records so they can immediately see, you know, the results of that or have it transferred to their doctor if you're going through a telemedicine service. Like some payers provide telemedicine, and if you use their telemedicine product and you pay online for that, then or the pay the insurance will actually pay for it right um then they will download a copy of that encounter note and send it to your provider so we talked about parity laws right now currently 12 states had well not this state this is prior to the pandemic so 12 states had no parity laws i haven't had a chance to go back in and look and see how many of them updated that because there's still some of them in legislation uh, going through so we'll see what happens at the end of this pandemic how many of them have stuck with that Here's a really great website, Center for Connected Health Policy. This website will give you a lot of information about the individual state policies. Um, they have it very well organized. I would go there and use it. I've used it a lot. And then credentialing. So, you know, the, um, the Federation of State Medical Boards says that as of January 2020, 49 states and DC, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands require a physician to be licensed in the state that the patient is located. So if you're giving telemedicine services to, and, and like for me, if I live in Utah, but I'm doing the telemedicine service for somebody in Arizona, I would need to be credentialed in Arizona as well. Um, they're licensed in that state as well. And then 14 state boards issue a special purpose license, right? So you may be working in a telemedicine, in a state where telemedicine, you have to have a special license or certification to, or, or certification to do that, to do telemedicine. Um, or a license to practice telemedicine across state lines. You, uh, four state boards require physicians to register to practice across state lines. So if you're practicing across state lines, you have to be on a special registry for that. 28 states and DC require private insurance companies and Medicaid to cover telemedicine services to the same extent as a face-to-face -face visit. That's awesome, 28 states, not enough. We need all the states to do that, right? Um, and then 18 states require Medicaid coverage for telehealth. That's actually expanded. One state requires private insurance to reimburse telemedicine services. So you have to reimburse for it. Okay. And that, that means that it has to be in the patient's coverage, right, as a benefit. The IMLC, this is the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, Compact and that'll be on your test. I saw that question in there. So IMLC. And it, is an ex it allows providers from different states that are gonna be practicing across state lines uh, to, to quickly get their licensing done in the state that they're going to see patients in. And there's 29 participating states. I'm sure this has expanded quickly through the PHE, but they haven't updated their record yet. And there's 43 medical and osteopathic boards that are all involved in this as well. And you can see the key down here, the, the legend, let me, um, pointer options, here we go. Right here, you see the uh, compact, the, the colored key for what's on the map. And then here's the website, you can go to learn more about how to do that, how to, to what, what happens, it's kind of like the CAQH that a lot of people use where you, put in, you create a profile about the physician, it's got every piece of information you need for credentialing, right, and licensure, and this is what is also used, but you're creating it under the IMLCC, and they um, do that, um, the credentialing, and expedite it for you. So I'm going to pop these three up real quick. Medicare's original telehealth process. So we're just going to go through this quickly, because I still have a lot to cover, and I'm already over my hour mark. I can't believe it. Like I told you, we could do this for a whole day and still there would be things to teach and learn. Um, so Medicare originally, they only allowed um, patients to have their beneficiaries to do telemedicine if those beneficiaries lived in a, um, um, yeah, sorry, I just all of a sudden, my, my brain went blank. It's, it's an HRSI, so it's a health restricted, um, oh, good grief, sorry. I cannot believe my brain just went blank. It's Monday morning, right? All right, I haven't had any caffeine. It is a health coverage area 
that shortage. It's a health professional shortage area. There we go. Healthcare professional shortage area. So the providers, like we talked about, that's the psychiatrists that were, you know, uh, half of US counties don't even have a single psychiatrist available. That's what this is. It's a health professional shortage area. And um, they have a site that you can get on. It's this hrsa.gov, data.hrsa.gov. And um, I know, I, I think temporarily they had put it, on, they had suspended it. So it might be back up. Not sure. You can go look at it if you want to. But prior to the pandemic, you had to put your patient's information in there, right, where they're located and locate uh, an originating site that that patient could go to to have their telemedicine service. So they couldn't have it in their home. That was completely against the rules. No telemedicine visits in the patient's home unless there were some very specific circumstances. And so here it was uh, in-stage renal disease. If you look right here, down here at the bottom, right, in-stage renal disease only and sorry, this mobile strikes you, stroke unit should be on the next line under a bullet of its own. But home was approved only if you had in-stage renal disease services being given to you via telemedicine. Um, and, and that was it. And then mobile stroke units, you know, these were placed strategically all around. Um, and if you were having a stroke or anything like that, you could do it through a mobile stroke unit as well. But these are the only places if you were a, a patient and you needed telemedicine and your doctor was, you know, hours away, if you lived in a health professional shortage area, you could get health, you could get telemedicine services by going to a physician or, or QHP's office, right? Any of them that offer those as a service, a hospital, a critical access hospital, a rural health clinic a federally qualified healthcare center, you get the, the picture here, any of these locations, you had to physically go there and somebody there would assist you with pulling up the screen, the monitor, doing all of your vital signs, whatever, and communicating with the doctor for your visit. That originating site, this location is the originating site, could charge a code to Medicare and get reimbursed for hosting you for that telemedicine visit, right? Then the distant site provider, that's the provider. That's the actually the location of the physician, right? Or the nurse practitioner or the PA or the nurse midwife or, you know, these are the approved prior to 20, the, the PHE changes. These are all the professionals that were allowed to perform telemedicine services for Medicare beneficiaries. Okay, remember, we're just talking Medicare. We gotta keep the separate from, you know, uh, private payers. And Medicaid. So these were allowed to perform. And they had to perform them at the location noted, at the address noted on their Medicare enrollment, provider enrollment information, right? Well, now we know that we have a lot of doctors who are performing services in their home. They're not having patients come to their home, but they're doing telemedicine from their office at home at their home address. That is not the address that's on the provider enrollment form, right? But there's been a waiver that says those providers do not, remind you, do not have to change their provider enrollment address to their home address if they're, if they're doing telemedicine from home. They do not have to during the PHE. That is waived. No problem there. Um, okay, and then HIPAA approved communications and software. This was that thing, you know, synchronous is audiovisual live, asynchronous store and forward, and that is specific to Alaska, Hawaii, the federal, you know, telemedicine demonstration program. And then remote monitoring data collected and transmitted. And then you had to be HIPAA compliant. So prior to the pandemic, remember there's been some revisions just for this time frame, you had to have a 128-bit level of encryption. It had to be able to be audited, archived, and have backup capabilities. And it had to meet all the state laws, right? Okay, next. Medicare's original telehealth process still, there's a lot of information in here. So here we had the approved originating site, approved distant provider type, right? Type of provider and location. And it had to meet the HIPAA communications. Then here are the services that you were allowed to perform. There were a hundred services, about a hundred services, a little more that you could perform. And they're all in these areas. These were what was approved. Okay, and then in December, uh, let's see, the guidelines were you would report a place of service to, 
because that came out in 2019, that they changed the place of service. Instead of reporting the GT modifier to say that this was a telemedicine service um, for you know regular providers, that's still required for CAQHs and uh, federally um, qualified, um, federal, what is it called? Federally qualified health centers still. So your hospital, your QHA based, your CAH based right here, and your federally qualified health care center, they still use the GT modifiers. But for everybody else, they said use place of service too. Commercial payers said, uh, you know, some of them accepted what Medicare did and said, yeah, go ahead and use a place of service too. We'll recognize it. But you need to know that based on your insurance contract and what their policies are, their published policies. Don't go by word of mouth. Blue Cross says this. No, show me the resource that makes you the expert because you have the documented resource, right? To show that and back up what you're saying. Commercial modifier 95 for those plans, uh, modifier 95, and that was what a lot of payers want. Um, even with place of service two, if they're accepting that, they still want 90, 95 to identify it as a telemedicine visit. Look at um, the originating and distant sites that are approved, not just for Medicare, but for your private payers as well, and make sure you are following that. And I'll give you a quick example on, on some audits that took place with Medicare. They found that, and, and you remember here, we talked about you can bill for the originating site, and then the distant site provider bills for his service, right? And I know a lot of people got confused about this originally, but the distant site provider is just billing CPT and HCPCS codes. Right, whatever the services that's been approved, these services here, there's a hundred of them, right? You know, if you're if you're doing an ENM established patient visit and it's a 99212 to 99215, and you've documented that and you've performed that over telemedicine, that is what the distant site provider is billing. They're billing the ENM code, and they're adding to that ENM code that is done in a place of service too, and with the 99214 may have a modifier 95 attached to it if it's commercial payer, right? That's how it's billed for the distance site provider. They don't get any extra special fee because it's telemedicine. They're just going to get paid because it's telemedicine, hopefully based on the state they're in and the payer policies. But for the originating sites, the, they would bill a G code for Medicare. Medicare would reimburse for the originating site host. Commercial payers unless they followed Medicare's guidelines, did not reimburse for that. And unless they said in their policies, you can bill us as an originating site hosting a, a patient for their telemedicine visit, unless they had that published in their policies, you weren't getting paid. You were just doing a volunteer service. So you want to make sure you understand what you're billing. So the originating site for Medicare, and this is where the audit, I'm going to go back to the audit, the originating site code was another indicator to Medicare that this was done via telemedicine, right? And then the visit, the service type by the provider was billed here with the code 02, modifier 95, but with Medicare, no 95 was just 02 or the GT modifier. And what Medicare was noticing is that they were paying for this originating site fee right here, but there was, I mean, sorry, they were paying for a distant site provider service done with a modifier um, GT or a place of service too. So they know it's telemedicine, but there was no originating site claim coming in from another payer that matched the data service for this client. So if you can imagine being on the payer's end, you get a claim that comes in and it's a telemedicine service. You see that, but you don't see an originating site claim come in. So that means that either the people hosting the telemedicine uh, visit, don't know that they can bill for it, right? Or it didn't take place in one of these locations. Where did it take place? In the patient's home. Well, if it took place in the patient's home and it doesn't have an ESRD diagnosis on it, this distant provider didn't do his job right. That patient should not have had that visit. And so there was a lot of money taken back because the patient was being seen in their home and that distant provider provided a service that was not an acceptable service. So on a three years later audit coming through, how many tens of thousands, hundred thousands, millions of dollars had to be paid back because of that? Um, pretty crazy. 
So you gotta make sure you're following your guidelines and you want to look at the documentation. That's really important. The documentation has to match up. It has to match up for um, um, the service itself. Like that CPT code, we all know that when you perform that in the office, that the CPT code, um, hopefully I'm still on. I just heard a ding ding on my computer. Um, sorry. So um, let me take a quick peek here and see if everything is still okay. Okay, just remember that if you miss anything that you'll have access to the playback of this event and, and, and you can always email me questions as well. So hopefully everything's still going okay. I just had a funny ding on my computer. I just wanna make sure everybody's still good. All right, so your documentation must match the CPT code description or the HICPICS code description. Nothing changes with that. If you're gonna bill for the service, you have to perform the work that is required for that service. And if I'm as an auditor coming back and looking at what you did, I wanna make sure that each component of that service, of that code description has been met in the documentation so that it supports the level of service that was being reported. Um, you wanna identify who the participants are in the um, encounter in the telemedicine visit. Um, was the originating site, where was it hosted? Was a nurse present? What was her name? The patient was present. Was their family member present? Was a child and their parents were present? You wanna identify that. And that you and your nurse maybe were present. Then you want to abide by, again, all the CPT HICPIX guidelines, the federal state laws, Make sure that the provider performing the service meets all of the credentialing and licensing requirements. Um, is it a new person, new patient versus an established patient? So you're following those guidelines. And also deductibles, coinsurance, and co-payments are properly collected and that the patient's aware that they'll have to pay those. Um, those are all things that you would probably want to consider adding, especially that part of the financial responsibility to your patient consent. And then you've got the consent. You just have to get it annually, but you better be watching for that every time and that your patient understands the consent. Okay. On Medicare's website currently, you can see right here, it says temporary addition for the PHE for the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, here you can see these are the codes that are approved. Here's just a short description you know, of what it is. And then here it tells you like, so where it's blank, these were already approved prior to the PHE. During the PHE, this one was added. So this service was added. This group psychotherapy service was added. And this psychophysiological therapy was also added. And then here, this is really important to make sure you watch. And you can get this, here's the link. This is an old link that I put on here from April of 2020, but it, they keep it updated monthly. Um, so you can go to cms.gov and just put in your search bar, telehealth services, and it will bring up this as well. So you can see what the services are. And when you click on this and open it, it opens up an Excel spreadsheet um, and you can edit it. So if you wanted to use, I mean, be wise with how you use this. This is great. You can see all of the telehealth visits. So open up your spreadsheet, edit it, take out anything that doesn't apply to your specialty or your organization and leave the rest there. And then use that as part of your, add that to your compliance plan. These are the approved services during the PHE that we use. And right here it says, can audio only interaction meet the requirements of synchronous, right? So remember, audio visual equals a live visit. It's synchronous. But they're saying these services in particular, if all you can get is the audio, so you're on the you know, phone doing it, you're you know, over the computer and you can't do the screen. I don't know how many of you have ever been on a conference call and all of a sudden connectivity in your area because everybody's working from home and everybody's on at the same time, right? Um, that you're whatever, you're, maybe you're in a remote location or just you know, a dead spot in your house and your video, the only way you can keep connected is if you disconnect your video, right? That's still approved right here. So watch for that. 
They want transparency. They want to give providers the benefit of the doubt. They want to see that you're trying to be compliant. You're doing everything within your power to be compliant. But when something goes wrong, you document it, you note it, you're transparent about it, right? That way they don't go, oh, they're trying to pull something over on us. And now we're going to find them. We're going to audit them hardcore. You want to be transparent and document well and tell your providers to document well. So in the middle of an, a visit and I had to delete the, I had to turn off the, the video um, in order to keep the connection with the patient or the patient couldn't get the connection, the video to come up. So we did it all audio. Just like, you know, when you have a, with the old way of doing e &M services, when you have to take a history on a patient, but they're unconscious, so you can't get a history. You don't just not take a history. You say the patient is unconscious and no family members are nearby, making it so that you could not access, a, you know, obtain a history from them. You be transparent. Okay, changes prior to the PHE. We talked about that. Um, there are uh, service locations changes, right? So we know that they added ESRD in the home. They added those mobile stroke units. Um, SUD was approved uh, for home treatment as well, which is great because that means these patients who really struggle and they're really worried about a stigma being attached to them, um, that they can get the care that they need. A lot of these places, they can get the care they need anytime. It's amazing. Um, and then the communication, so the T CTBS services that were added, your virtual check-ins, your online assessments, these are all your non-face-to-face -face encounters, right? portal, email, and the codes that you would use for it. And remember, there's a difference here. And I want to I want to clarify this too. This will help you with a lot of things. If you don't already know this, this will help you as you move forward in your coding career. That the official guidelines that you learned, right, to take your test to get your credential are CPT, HICPICS, and ICD-10. But CPT is the official code set. And payers may change their mind on the code that they want like you will see this g code here see this g code g2012 so we follow cpt guidelines just like medicare says we follow cpt guidelines but when we come across a code and the description is something that we disagree with as a payer we will create a hickpix code for it and our own description and guidelines and for our beneficiaries, we require that you bill with that code and follow those guidelines rather than the CPT codes, right? So for example, if you did a virtual check-in for a Medicare patient, Medicare beneficiary, and you build it with 99446, Medicare would deny the claim. And you'll be like, but it's a valid claim and I documented everything right. But uh, 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 you better go look. Is there a policy? We want to look at your local coverage determinations, your national coverage determinations your MLN Matters Medicare articles. If you're not signed up for MNL, MLN Matters articles, do so. Find a code, we offer everything. And I'm gonna show you that. I'm really hoping I can get through this quickly because I wanna show you a demo of how that works with find a code uh, as well. So if you bill Medi regular, you're gonna bill the CPT code, but if there is a special policy uh, published policy by the payer, like Medicare has, you would bill by their guidelines, okay? If the private payer does not, if you're dealing with a private or commercial payer, and they do not have a published guideline, they have to have written published policy that says either that they follow Medicare's guidelines and they want the G2012 instead of this, which means you would have to follow G2012 for that payer. We know United Healthcare is like that. They follow almost everything that Medicare does and they publish their policies the state that they do. So if Medicare comes out with a G2012, you can bet United Healthcare is gonna require it as well. But let's say Blue Cross Blue Shield, they, they don't have a published policy and you get audited or they deny your claim, ask them for the published policy on that why they're not doing that so that you can see the published policy. And I would go in and look and search. I have many times found that an auditor from a payer who has claimed something was done wrong was actually incorrect and it was done right. Don't be afraid to go research it and look at it. Be that expert. 
understand how to use those payer policies, understand what your state and federal guidelines are. I mean, I, I'm sure all of you who are experienced coders or have just learned about coding, understand what a National Correct Coding Inst you know, Institute NCCI edit is. CPT has their own edits, right? They're not NCCI edits, but they are similar. They are procedure to procedure edits. And those are, if you open up your book and look at a surgical code, you'll see underneath it will say use with or do not report with. That's the same as Medicare's, right? CMS is NCCI edits, but the edits are different between the NCCI and CPT on many codes. CPT is a little more lenient. Medicare is a little more stringent. So the NCC edits are going to be more stringent. Don't just apply NCCI edits to every claim. If your payer that you're contracted with and that beneficiary came to be seen and now you're filling out that claim, you don't apply NCCI edits to that claim if that payer does not require it in their published policies. They have to state that they follow and want you to adhere to the NCCI edits and the policy manual that goes with that edit, with those edits. And um, so be very careful with that. Don't be giving back money or, or not getting money where you're due it. Um, and make them be accountable themselves for their own policies. Make them produce a published policy to keep to, to help you stay informed. Uh, use your payer reps, um, you know, appropriately because they can get information for you that way. All right, spend too much time on this one. Let's go. Okay, so uh, we talked about the GT modifier and that they're still valid on. Um, uh, where is it at? Oh, the CAH, the critical access hospitals, and the um, um, federally qualified uh, clinics. And then you have the GQ modifier, right? This is one that is used with store and forward for Medicare. It indicates that this was not done synchronously. Um, and you would probably want to check with your Medicare administrative carrier. Uh, like Novitas or CGS or you know Noridian, uh, whoever your Medicare administrative contractor is that processes your claims for Medicare, and ask them if you do audio only services, do you need to apply the GQ, or are they okay with just your place of service um, code um, and and your notations? So. Place of service is 02, but during the PHE, this is changed. And it's interesting because if there is a state that doesn't require, um, um, no, let me back up. Um, this is important because place of service indicates the location that the patient and the provider were at the time of the service, right? Where it was done. It was done in the office 11. It was done in the hospital 21. It was done in observation 22. You know, whatever it is that your location is. And they wanted to change that to O2, and they did for a period of time. So that was O2 for telemedicine services. But now they said, we really want to be able to monitor where these took place. So we want you to bill, um, report the place of service code being the place that it would have been rendered had it been in person. So if your doctor is at home and your patient is at home, but regularly outside of the PHE, they would have performed this visit in the office, then you would report it with place of service 11. Okay. All right, so let me add these on here real quick. Um, so we know state Medicaid is governed by each individual state. So identify your state laws. Workers' compensation is the same. It's state by state. Can you see why telehealth gets very complicated very quickly? Um, because you have to, I mean, how long would it take to do a presentation that covers every state and then Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands and DC, right? It would take a long time. So you have to know your resources. Go to that website that I showed you earlier, the resources in your PDF. Um, and go look up for your specific state and then go look at your state federal you know, re um, regulations and find out what they say about it as well. You can bet because of the PHE, there's probably a lot of information on telemedicine added to our state uh, regs. And then commercial payers are also governed by state laws. You want to check your individual coverage because just because you know a payer does cover telemedicine services doesn't mean that patient has a plan 
with that insurance that includes telemedicine. So just like you check for you know eligibility and benefits for surgery or medications or whatever, you wanna check and make sure that you've got telehealth benefits as well. Um, and then verify your modifiers and your locations and your provider types. Uh, we talked about provider documentation. I'm gonna let you just go through that um, on your own. But one of the things that um, I would also suggest that you add to your documentation, especially during the PHE, is that patient circumstances, what the patient cir circumstances were that led to a telehealth, right? I mean, it can cover anything now. You know, patient has a chronic condition, does not want to present in the office for care. A patient has COVID symptoms, we're performing this telemedicine, you know, whatever it might be, you want to add that in there. Uh, the consent we talked about. And now we're just going to talk very quickly here about the year of the zombie apocalypse, right? Basically. And I have to laugh. And the only reason I put this on here is because um, find a code every year we do an April Fool's joke. And April Fool's, um, we have a develop, one of our developers, one of the owners, it's just, he's just hilarious. And we just thought it would be really funny. We've actually almost gotten in trouble for doing it a couple of times, which means it's a really, really good uh, April Fool's trick, right? And what it is, is that we will create a whole set of ICD-10 codes specific to like a zombie apocalypse. And we have one, it's really funny. Um, and if you would like access to it, you know, you can email me and tell me and I'll see if I can get a copy to you. Um, but it's so funny. And so we will publish this out there and it'll just be like, we'll post a, a note that says, uh, don't forget about the newest uh, edition, the mid-year edition to the ICD-10 codes, blah, blah, blah. And there'll be a little disclaimer somewhere in small print down at the bottom. But if you start reading about it, you know, it, it will have an ICD-10 code that we've made up and a description that goes with it. And it sounds and looks and reads exactly like an ICD-10 code. And it'll even have excludes and includes in it. And it will talk about the topic. And we did one on the zombie apocalypse. So if you ever have a minute and you just want a good laugh, uh, send it our way. We have some funny ones in there. And watch for them. Get on our new on our, our newsletter. You can get our weekly email. And it also announces webinars. So I do webinars every month on Find a Code. And they're free to anybody. But you can't go back and listen to them a second time unless you're a subscriber. Okay? We don't give out the slides like you've got a PowerPoint presentation today. We don't do that. It's just an informative, educational. I love to make sure that we're giving great support to our providers and the staff that does coding, billing, and reimbursement for them. So we do educational videos, webinars that are free that way. Um, and we usually do them every month. Sometimes we haven't been able to do them in a certain month, depending on whether or not we have you know, other obligations or a conference or something. But uh, you can get on the website, findacode.com, and you can uh, go to um, community and look up websites under, you know, um, the menu and you can, I mean, webinars and you can see what's coming up. But if you get on the list and you sign up for a free webinar, then they will get you on their email list and they'll send you an email and it'll have links to articles and it'll have, you know, information in there that you'll get notified when uh, stuff's coming up. And this will also pop up for you in those. So don't miss out on those because those are great. Okay, so we know the growth of telemedicine and flexibilities during the pandemic. We have seen a massive expansion and I wanted to go in and check and see what that looked like. You know, how much has telemedicine expanded just because of the pandemic? And in the first quarter of 2020, you have to remember, we didn't even declare anything until March, right? So that first quarter, how much telemedicine was used um, in 2019 and compared to 2020. And that's just the first quarter. So we're seeing some uptick in the COVID symptoms before they figured out what was really going on and that this is now a public health emergency. So they tracked that and they identified 154% increase in telehealth visits in March, 2020 compared to the same period in 2019. And you can see the numbers over here on the right, you know, 1.6 million compared to 1.8. 084 in 2019. But the interesting thing was this, and this is what I really like about pulling out good study information, is this shows that most of the encounters in that first quarter, right, those were for people who had COVID symptoms. But after that, it was for people who were trying to avoid COVID. 
So you can imagine how many people were showing up at doctor's offices and hospitals. They didn't know what they had, right? And then they're spreading it all over the place and to the providers because nobody knows that they have it. Matter of fact, I have a son who went and they said, we tested you for all kinds of stuff. You don't have any of the influenza A or B. You have all, he had all the symptoms of COVID. And this was in December of 2019. And they said, we don't know what you have, but here's some Tamiflu and you do have an infection going on as well. So we're going to give you a Z-Pack. And um, he got better, but he was really, really sick. He's young, he's in his 20s. So that was to his benefit, but he was sick. And um, it'll be interesting to see what happens when he gets his shot, because if he actually had COVID at that time, when he, if he gets his vaccine, he will actually probably have a more severe reaction to the vaccine because it's the body saying, hey, 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 we know what this is and attacking it, right? So you get inflamed and you, you feel sick um, because your body's immune system is already identifying that virus from the protein spike and coming after it. So some people get a little more sick on their uh, vaccines than others do. Um, and it's most of the time, it's just a really good sign that your immune system is working because it's attacking and creating this environment of inflammation and whatnot so it can kill those bad viruses. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, telehealth waivers. So I'm just gonna let you look through this on your own. We have talked about this, uh, especially on the right side. But um, you know, the Secretary of, Secretary of Health and Human Services has the authority to waive certain, the 1135 um, you know, section of the Social Security Act and you know, apply all those to federal and uh, states even. And then you have those changes are always temporary. They're 90 days or to the, for the duration of the public health emergency. Now remember, if this public health emergency had ended in December of 2020, then that's it. It's all of 2020 from March through December that it would have been applicable, but it's still going on in 2021. So automatically it goes to the end of 2021, right? But you still have to watch payer policy changes because the pandemic may end and policies may go as of this date. Let's say the pandemic ends, they, 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 sorry, they say the PHE ends on August 1st. You've got to look and see what payers individually are doing that you're contracted with and how they want billing to change or go back to how it was or what that means or what changes they've made permanently. So you want to watch that. But we had this massive wave of changes that came out March, April, May, August. I know because I write books and I do presentations and I create a card that I'm going to show you and share with you. Um, I had to stay up on all of these and each one of these was over a thousand pages long. It was insane and detailed, detailed information. So it felt like I was trying to take a little sip out of a fire hose going full blast. And I know my counterpart at Find a Code, when she was the same way, we, we constantly were on probably, you know, 16 hours a day um, during this time frame, just trying to make sure that we were providing up to date and correct information for our subscribers. All right. So, um, flexibilities, you know, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, skip this. We did talk already about public uh, facing apps and not using those. Uh, we talked about um, the, the CTBS services and we talked about protecting, you know, patient information by using the properly approved HIPAA stuff. Uh, we want to make sure that we're very careful there. Uh, you can look for additional information on the Medicare uh, administrative contractors through your individual one, through the MLM matters, check your contracted providers, you know, and I want to, you know, this went around a lot in um, the beginning, especially April, May, June, July, that, oh, we're not going to get audited. Yes, you are. There are very specific things that they say they will not audit you for. Everything else they will audit you for, and trust me, they are already doing the audits. So dot your I's, cross your T's, make sure you understand that what you're supposed to do and that you're compliant. This is a free card for all of you today. If you go to findacode.com, uh, you will see up in the upper corner, let um, me see, I think I have a picture of that screen here, right here, up in this corner, findacode.com. It will tell you, click on this, and all you'll do is put in your information right here, your, your name and your email, and it will provide that link to you, and you can go and download your card. And, um, you know, it, it'll be paper, obviously, because whatever you printed on it, you're, 
work. But this is up to date. We keep this up to date every time a new change comes out. So don't think that your card that you get today is up to date in two weeks from now. If something came out um, differently or changed, then you're going to want to look and see about getting another one. Um, so provider awareness. Uh, this is a really big key for you for becoming an expert in your practice. Uh, just another little thing, uh, a trick that will be really helpful. Medicare does a proposed rule. So if you take Medicare, if you're contracted with Medicare or any of the payers who follow Medicare's guidelines, the ACA plans included, if they follow Medicare's guidelines or Medicaid, then you want to keep an eye on the proposed rule. It usually comes out at the beginning of the year. So in the next couple of months, you should see the one for 2022. It's the proposed rule. These are all the changes. It'll be over a thousand pages, I promise. Get your highlighter out, get some popcorn, put on a movie in the background, give it some time, right? And go through it. And yeah, you know what my weekends look like sometimes, right? Um, anyway, and go through it and identify anything that will apply to your organization. Be aware of it. They ask for feedback. They want your questions. They want your suggestions and they're serious about it. Every question or suggestion that you enter in and submit to them, they will respond to in the final rule. So the proposed rule, as we all know, like with the E&M changes, right, they proposed that they were going to do a 50% reduction on the lowest cost um, service when you did a minor procedure the same day as an E&M. Remember, they did that. And they also proposed that we were going to have the five uh, E&M codes were going to be reduced to just two. Um, for each section, like a new patient would have two levels, an established patient would have two levels, and that didn't take place. None of that happened. That's because in this time frame, a lot of people said, what are you talking about? We don't agree with that. That's not fair, and here's why. Don't just go and say, wah, 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 I don't like that change. Get in there and say, in our organization, this is what we see, and this is where we see that that's going to be problematic for us, or it's going to be damaging to our, our you know, ability to keep our doors open, and you want to say that. You want to give them information that is useful. So don't just be critical. You know, I hate that. I'll get people who give a response to a webinar that I'd give, like, I've heard better. And you're like, really? Give me a break. Would you want to hear that if you were presenting the webinar? I highly doubt it, right? But somebody who says, oh, I noticed that you had this, this um, slide and you had the information swapped or it repeated itself. I don't think you meant it for it to do that. That's helpful to me because then I can go and say, oh, I had copied this slide over and meant to just change out one thing and I didn't. That's helpful, right? So same goes with provider guidelines and rules. Medicare proposed rule. Give feedback that is useful, not just critical, but useful. Everybody knows that nobody likes the fee schedule for Medicare. You know, get your picket and, you know, poster and go march on the White House that way. Don't, you know, talk to your senators and your don't go march on the White House. I, after all the crap that just happened last year, we don't want to see any of that. But what I'm saying is like, I used to have doctors who would say, oh, I'm not doing that. That's not fair. That's not fair. I'm like, what are you going to do? Take a vacation and go complain to the proper people, you know, in DC. I can't do anything about that. Do you want to get paid for this visit today? Then follow the rules, right? Be constructive. Be submitting things that are beneficial and will get you answers. If you have questions, ask the question in a way that you can get an answer from it, not just complaining about it. Get an answer. And I've found many times when I've submitted a question and I'm thinking at it from my perspective, when they respond, the response is something that I hadn't even considered. And maybe it affects 80% of the people that way. I just happen to be in a really tight subspecialty that it affects me differently. That's beneficial information. So think carefully about what you submit. The final rule comes out, and this is what is final. These are the policies going into place. So make sure, and this comes out before October 1st, right? So um, make sure you go through that. Again, that's your second movie night with popcorn and a highlighter. You know, get in there and identify those, and then update your practice, your payer, I mean, your providers, your staff, your compliance plan accordingly. Uh, the fee schedule we know is slated to have a 10 point something percent reduction rate in our conversion factor for RVUs. And that was postponed um, in um, by the consolidation, the, sorry, the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021 in December. Senate passed that 
which said we won't make a 10% cut, we will only do um, a 3% overall cut. And what they did is to do that, they have to, so I don't know how many of you know this, but with the Medicare fee schedule, they are stuck to a, an amount and they can only go X amount of dollars over it, right? And, um, and then they have to start cutting money out of other RVUs, of other services. With the E&M services, the new ones that took place, 2021, 99201, sorry, 99202, because 201 was deleted to 215, that had a pay increase. Because that had a pay increase, they had to make a pay decrease in other procedures. They were able to delay that because medicine has been hit so hard financially. They didn't want to hurt them and just, you know, completely do them in. So they stopped the code that they were going to implement, G2211. Remember, that was this new inherent complexity add on code. It was supposed to pay like $15 each time. And Medicare said they expected that everybody would use it um, on every E&M service, but it's really not well defined and the guidelines for it aren't. And to me, that's just a trap for being audited later, right? So if you go in saying, okay, well, we've done it according to this, but somewhere along the line, they've updated the rules and the documentation guidelines and you weren't aware of that. Now they're coming back and auditing you and you're like, oh, that was bad. We have to pay all that money back. Anyway, they put it on hold because they're gonna revise that code. And they put it on hold till 2024. And by doing so, they figure they have another $3 billion that was budgeted to pay this code for 2021 to 2024 that they will be able to pay for um, not reducing the conversion factor fee by 10%, only 3%. So something to be aware of. Here's a list of common questions and answers. I'm gonna let you go through that on your own. Teamwork to prevent fraud, information, information information and sharing that information there is no excuse for poor documentation if you got a doctor who's proud or a provider who's proud or doesn't want to listen show them the penalties go and look up the false claims act penalties they are painful and i will tell you as of late in audits that i have done i have not seen less than two million in an audit in a while and that's two million that they're requesting back okay um, and that's because most of these are extrapolated. And then on top of that, they can add fines and penalties. So that's a lot of money. You wanna be very well informed as a provider and help them understand how they can protect themselves. Find a code, here's the website. And now, you know, if you still have questions, here's me, but I'm gonna show you um, this really quickly. I want to share with you my, um, website and i know we have time for questions and i'm going to get to that as well and um let me see here let me see if i can grab this um okay so in find a code and this is uh this is me for find a code and you can get in and you can see for example um on the account if you go to account if you have an account you go to my account and you can manage it there but if you want to see what our subscription page is it's right here and this shows you our our fees are man for what they what you get this is insane the prices are 400 dollars. this is the one i reckon recommend if you work in a professional uh capacity as a coder an auditor or a clinic administrator, right? Um, this is all um, professional services and you have access to a ton of information. This is everything here that you have access to. You can add on things if you want to, right? So let's say I wanna be able to, if I'm an auditor, I need to go be able to go look back so many years, like I'm doing an audit three years ago. I wanna go see what the rules were three years ago. Then I'm gonna add this once it's, you know, gives me that, uh, per person, I can add $200 for the year, and it get, lets me go back to everything in that time frame for five years. Historical content, 10. If you do research, that's one that a lot of companies don't want from us if they do a lot of research going back way far. But audits are usually, you know, three to five years, so this is a good one. Um, you know, your libraries, your manuals, you have newsletters. So there's a ton of stuff in here um, that you know you can add on if you if you want to. You can ask for a free trial. I think they give it to you. It's either a week or two weeks that they, if you ask for it from one of the customer service agents, they will show you. 
but you know um things that i don't think i would ever want to live without um here um is and if you were trying to do it for like one organization i would want this and here's you know how much money do you spend for ceus each year for 70 dollars a person you can have up to 30 ceus and then access to webinars as well um, and those aren't the free webinars these are through bc advantage and they have great ceus that cover for apc and uh, ahima and so forth um, but anyway you can see everything here and that's your subscription okay so i'm just going to show you really quickly um, here's a surgical code 64633 i just put it in um, up here in the corner and i can choose if i'm wanting to look up something in particular i can go i want to look at a keyword or i can look up a code index or commercial payer policies for that um, specifically but i'm this is i'm set to my my code so i look it up this is my code page main code page every code icd10 kickpick cpt has its individual code page we show you what um, the actual description is if there's images that go with it you can click on those and you know, Know, scroll through them as well if that's helpful um, additionally you can come down and see common language descriptions these are awesome this is plain uh, plain terms explains to you what this procedure is how it's done you can almost match it up to an operative report in many cases it'll go through the process of what happens um, then you have like here's your chapter so just like in your book i can see what the guidelines are prior to it so here's the guidelines for surgery, right? Therapeutic, diagnostic, supplies, whatnot. And then I can see the section notes specific to this right here. And I can see these section notes. So this talks about chemodenervation, um, you know, ablation, radiofrequency. And then here's my codes. So my highlighted code and all the codes around it. So I can see what they are. And any of these are linkable. So I can click on any of them that I want to. And these are, um, you know, icons that tell you what this is and why so you, that there's a cpt assistant article that's connected to it here's your main dashboard down here i can see what the rbu is i can see what the medicare fee schedule is for non-facility i can see if there's any global days attached to it there's the 11 medicare policies attached to this one there's 27 articles and newsletters there's crosswalks to icd-9 and icd-10 and yes icd-9 still people have to deal with those crosswalks there's coding tips and there's CCS classifications. And if I click on any of these, it will take me like this. This one will take me to this green right here. If I click on it, it will open it right there. And I can auto open. So I can keep that these are constantly open every time. Um, and like here's add on codes. So if I'm billing this code, it will tell me if there's an add on that can be used with it. Um, or if it is an add-on code itself, it, what codes it is reported with. Also, a great thing here is top modifiers. It'll show you what some of the most common modifiers are, at what percentage. It doesn't mean that they were paid. It just shows you what people are reporting. So we try to give you as much data and information. We have the AMA CPT vignette in here, so they give you examples. I mean, you know, typical patient, pre-service, intra-service, post-service, last review. Um, or hospital, your UCR, usual customary and reasonable services. If you work for an ASC, we let you know if this is a covered surgical procedure in an ASC setting. So that is already preset. And I have done audits where the payer, the provider was getting paid to perform the surgery in an ASC, but the ASC was not getting paid. They couldn't figure out why, it's because it wasn't a covered surgical procedure, it wasn't on the approved list. And they didn't know that. And they lost tens of thousands of dollars because of it. So things that you really want to be aware of additional so here's our medicare policies um, when you set up you can set up your um, your information at the very top let me get all the way up here when you set up your account like i showed you under you know your account information you can set it up um, i do a lot of auditing and stuff so you'll see you know different things or you can do it the unadjusted rate um, national unadjusted rate and I can see what the difference is if I change it so this is 437.56 national unadjusted but if I go California it updates it it's 454 right I can also if I have that historical if I don't have the historical purchase then each year that I am subscribed with find a code I have access to all of those years that I've been subscribed um, if not um, if I have not uh, purchased the history, but if I purchase the history, then I can set the date back, you know, 
to a single to a specific date if I want to. And it will reset my calculator and it will show me, look, that 454 was 423 back in 2015. So that's the information. And then lastly, if you've done anything with um, AMCI, and, and I know they use the E&M calculator tool, we have a lot of tools and information in here. But here's our E&M calculator tool. You can come in, you can decide if you're doing it for the 2020 calculator, which would be any of the services that are still based on the old way of doing it or new. And we're constantly updating this with new information and hints and, and tips. Uh, but you can come in here and say, OK, I want to do a new patient office visit. I'm going to do it based on MDM. And I can change it here if I need to go to establish patient, right? I can calculate by time. I'll go back to the home page if I want to. But did I get a medically appropriate history, a medically appropriate examination? That's based on the provider. So you, as the expert in your practice, would be able to determine whether it was an appropriate was present or not. And remember, this is required. A medically appropriate history and a medically appropriate exam is required. It's not scored. It's still required. And when you come down to medical necessity in, a, in an audit, I'm going to be looking at your history and examination because I want to know, is this service justifiable? You know, if you can give me a patient history that explains, well, wow, this is what's going on and, and it's manifest in the objective findings in the exam, then I'm, it's going to support your medical decision making, right? But here's your number and problems complexity. And there's little hints here that tell you exactly what those definitions are that have been for the terminology that's been defined and everything. So if I come up here and I select, let's see, if I select these, it's scoring it. You can see the score here. If I select how many of these were done, it's scoring it. And then I say maybe just prescribe some drugs and it's collecting it all here and it gives it to you here. If you're auditing an internal record right here, you can print, you know, this is for John Doe, uh, date of service, you know, 2121, and you can say, you know, uh, missing um, medically appropriate uh, history uh, to support medical necessity. And you can print that. None of this is kept by our website. We keep no PHI. You could put PHI all over this, but once you print it, it's gone. Once you leave this page, it is gone. Okay, so this is useful for internal audits as well for education and training. Uh, there are searches, but the tip, you can go to find a code page. And let me go to the main page. There's your COVID link, right? But here, if you go to the question mark, you can see all the tutorials. You do not have to have a subscription. You can come in here and you can look at all of our tutorials. You can see you know, what, what they are. And, and when they pop up, like commercial payer policies, it's a pull up based on the code in the code page. The new coding rules and complex changes. Across and it's the right there. It's an embedded time. video. So you can watch it and follow along. Uh, you can determine what, if anything, you are interested in. And, um, that, and that's how that works. So um, let me see here. I wanted to, the last final thing that I wanted to show you um, is if you have any questions at all, we would love to have you, um, you know, send us, send me a quick email and uh, send it to the Amy at, um, and my little transition didn't work as quickly as, I, as well as I'd hoped that it would. Um, there you go, right there. There's my email address. And I would like to answer some questions. Um, let's take a quick peek and see um, Miss Tracy or Miss Rochelle or Miss J, Mrs. J, is there, I can't get this, this question section to open up for me how I would like. Um, let's see here. Hello, Miss Amy. There we go. Yes, how are you? Can you hear me? Oh, that was great. I enjoyed your presentation. Um, I'm looking at the questions right now, actually waiting for anything to pop up. So coders, if you have any questions, now is your chance. That was a great presentation. I love it, Miss Amy. And that find a code is so cool. <laughs> 
there's just so many things in there and we're just constantly creating ways to help. I mean, when I first started with Find a Code, I worked as a consultant and I was working for a large radiology practice at the time in pain management. And they asked me if I would just use it day to day to see, you know, from a professional's opinion, what it needed. And that was exciting to see that there were so many great tools available to quickly identify. I mean, it took the place of, I can't even begin to tell you how many books on my desk and then having to repurchase all of those books every year. I could get on and I could just have my resource books, you know, my CPT and HickFix and whatnot, because I, I always have those every year anyway, but I can have them as backup um, just because for me, you know, I've been doing this for 30 years, so that's comforting to have the book in hand but everything is is right there available and i encourage you please sign up for those webinars we just had one on prolonged evaluation and management services and we have another one coming up soon and i can't remember what it is let me see i can pull it up but if any of you have questions in the meantime please ask so in find a code if i come to community under the more tab i come to community and i come down to webinars right and here's webinars upcoming march we have telehealth changes so this is going to be more specific of uh, to the um to the changes that took place but if you look at recent uh, we have a ton in here about um, covid about uh, the e m changes and if you have a subscription, you can get in and go look at any of the past ones uh, that, that you're interested in. If you went in here and you just looked at e &M, for example, let's see here, e &M, here's how to select it based on time and prolonged services. That's the one that was just recently done. There's a whole list. Um, but a lot of, lot of really, every way that you can imagine to search for a code, information on Medicare, newsletters, guidelines, dictionaries, all of your code sets you can locate them in there but um any questions come up yes i do have one miss um miss amy that was really great resources there um so the question came from miss denise the question is how much is a final code for an individual who wants it four hundred dollars a year for the professional and you can base that on a monthly subscription, but you get a discount. So it's $40 a month. Um, according to that, let me pull that back up and I can show you what that was. So right here, if I go to my account or go account, you can go to the subscribe page. And if I did it monthly, it's $40 a month. But if I do it annually, I'm getting basically getting two months for free. So, I mean, it's kind of nice, an $80 discount on that. And if you sign up for multiples of people, um, they could give you a discount on top of that. Um, so you would just need to talk to customer service about that. And if you decide that this is something that you're interested in, when you contact our findacode.com and you speak with one of our customer service agents, uh, please let them know that you attended this AMCI conference. Um, and that feedback comes back to me so that I know that any of you who, you know, I can follow up with you or you can send me an email. And if you have questions on, they'll even go in and show you how to use things and then follow up with you. And don't get lost in there. There's so much. So many great tools, but yeah, forty dollars a month. I this is the one that I would recommend any day of the week to anybody who's a coder or in a management capacity who has to do research or auditing. Okay, I have two more questions here, Miss Amy. Do you want to address them? Sure. Yeah, time. So um, the other one, I think I'm gonna go with the follow up one. This is again from Ms. Denise. So she said she'd do labs, would that help her? Yeah, we have a lot of information on labs in here as well. And we have a couple of labs, lab companies that we work with. Um, where is my, I was trying to see if I could find it really quick. I, I know they made some recent changes on lab also, but you know what I would do? I would come here to custom to find a code website click on this question mark 
and go to the live chat and it's i won't i would click on it right here but they would answer me immediately <laughs> so just click on live chat and they will show you exactly uh, where that is but you can see we have medical lab test search and there's a tutorial here go ahead and, and take a peek at that um, as well um, and then all of the guidelines like i would i would constantly be commercial payer policy is an add-on um, but it is a, a huge benefit because when you when you go in like just for this particular code that um, I did the search on earlier if I come in I'll show you how that works if I come into a commercial payer policy I can select payers that I want you know like maybe I want Anthem I'm going to do Anthem and I want um, you know uh, Cigna and Aetna any of their policies will come up here direct links so you can get into their website to their policies on those specific things um, and see what they what they have to say um, and that's really really helpful with trying to get you know navigate in and you can bookmark them as, as well so you can say you know filter bookmarks matching you know anything that i've, I've marked over this period of time and any payers and whatnot and you can make notes in this in the information as well so you can add notes to this code Let's say that you build this code all the time and you know that Medicare is auditing it and looking for very specific things and you have another payer that needs pre-authorization but they require you know a facet uh, diagnostic facet injections prior to and so you have to have so many of those you can go into your notes section uh, sorry let me get back here here and I can I can add a note anything that I want to this I can add this code to my code list I can come back and I can edit it and audit it and take it out and do anything I want, I can print this page and then I can use those notes um, for a training coming up. Maybe my providers need a new training. So there's there's a lot of things that you can do. We actually have a users conference coming up um, in May, which is great because it lets me get into the details of showing you how to use the service, how to use this, this program. Wonderful, this is such a great tool, Miss Amy. I'm loving it so much <laughs> and i think these wonderful coders are loving it too somebody said great tool for collectors as well um oh, yeah. but going back to the other question earlier somebody asked if the webinars are certified for ceu credits no so the free webinars are not but as i was telling you before if you go in and you and you do the add-on for and it's so inexpensive and the information is so great um, I even do this, so VC Advantage, uh, where did it go? Uh, additional add-ons. Um, here we go, VC Advantage right here. This gives you all, you can see who, it's, so it's one full year VC Advantage magazine, which is a massively informative uh, site. They're great, that magazine has so much information in it. And then it gives you access to 30 CEUs and webinars, and this is updated monthly. Um, even including a lot of the stuff that I do, articles and things will be added in here as well. And then they can apply through BC for those uh, CEUs. And so you can get CEUs for any of these companies, any of these credentials. So if that's something that's beneficial to you, you know, it's a great resource. And that's discounted. So if you went to BC by itself, that's not what you would pay. Um, anyway that's wonderful um I, it looks like that was the last question i've seen so far miss amy okay well i hope everybody has a wonderful rest of their conference experience this week and um, don't forget you're always welcome to email me if you have any questions And I'm thinking you're still not seeing your questions and your chat box, Miss Amy. And just if you could allow me, to telling you here in the chat, thank you for some great information. Okay, from Pamela. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, I don't know why I wasn't able to see that, but thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the support. You guys have a nice conference. Thank you, Miss Amy. And then one more thing while you know I'm here, if you allow me, I can go ahead and share that link to these um, attendees right now so they can get access to it if they want to complete the assessment. Would you like me to do that, Miss Amy? Sure, absolutely. 
there's some All questions right. there that'll help you and um, and and for your cer your certification, your CEU. Wonderful. Okay, so I did share it in the chat. So if you want to go ahead and get started on the assessment, or if you want to wait to the webinar, we'll also send you a um, a responder an hour after this webinar closes, and then you can get access to that as well. Um, again, Miss Amy, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. It's our honor um, to have you here joining us in another March Madness event. Hopefully, you'll come back for more <laughs> next year. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Thank you. This is Jay. Ms. Tracy, are you here? Would you like to say something? You're welcome, you. Hi, Ms. Rochelle. Hi, hey, Ms. Amy. Thank you so much for the wonderful, wonderful presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I do have to say the Find a Code tool is an amazing tool to have, and um, I've I've been able to see it in uh, in play in some of our our uh, you know presentations and stuff. So it's wonderful to see that. Thank you, Ms. Amy, for uh, again for the wonderful presentation. I learned a lot today, and thank you everyone for joining. And I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you. And I just want to end things by saying that was outstanding. And I can't say thank you enough. And coders or experts or future telemark telemedicine <laughs> experts, I just want to thank you for coming and we hope to see you at the remaining events and Ms. Amy, hopefully you will join us next year. I'm going to put it out there. All right, everyone. We'll see you at the next event. Four thousand exam passers and free classes at AMCI. Learn to go straight from home or on the road at AMCI. We're on the East Coast, the West Coast. We're all around the world. AMCI. AMCI. AMCI.